Hello and welcome to this Royal Society video podcast. I'm Wendy Barnaby and today I'll be talking to Dr Alex Thornton from the Department of Zoology at the University of Cambridge. Alex has co-authored a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B, which is all about culture and tradition in meerkats. It's called Multi-Generational Persistence of Traditions in Neighbouring Meerkat Groups. And Alex, you've been studying what time these meerkats wake up in the morning. Yes, that's right. So over the past 10 years or so, we've noticed that some groups of meerkats consistently get up at different times to their neighbours. So this is a photograph of one of the meerkats coming out of his sleeping burrow in the morning. So they tend to come out as a group, more or less at the same time. And it's strange because over the past 10 years or so, we've even set our alarm clocks by it. So there are certain groups that when you go to them, you get up a little bit later in the morning because they're just quite lazy. So this paper is all about whether this behaviour might actually constitute a tradition, something that's passed on by learning through the generations. Well, we'll talk about traditions in a minute, but just before that, tell me a bit more about these meerkats. I mean, they live in the Kalahari Desert. Yes, that's right. So we study them at a study site in the, in the southern Kalahari, so that's in the far north of South Africa, near the border with Botswana. And the meerkats are what's known as cooperative breeders. So they live in groups where reproduction is monopolised by a dominant pair. There's a dominant male and a dominant female, and they produce the majority of the pups born in the group. The rest of the group tend not to breed themselves, but help to care for the pups of the dominant pair. So these are obligately social animals. And what do we mean by tradition? It's quite important here, isn't it, that the breeding males join other groups because yes. this is a whole population sharing its, its genes. Yes, so a tradition is essentially a, a behavioural trait that characterises a group that's spread by learning. And of course, in human societies, there are countless traditions. And one of the difficulties in studying animal traditions is that a lot of studies have looked at populations that live in different areas. So, for example, one might look at populations of chimpanzees in different parts of Africa and see that they use different types of tools, for example. And so this looks like a tradition. But what we don't really know is whether this is spread by learning from one another or whether it's maybe the result of genetic differences between groups. So the nice thing about our meerkat groups is that we have multiple different groups that, as you say, are part of the same population, and there's movement between them. So males always breed outside the group in which they were born. And so that means that we can be more certain that genetic factors aren't responsible for the differences that we see. And also we have to think about environmental factors too, don't we? So that they are not um, muddying the picture, so that we're quite sure that it is learning from animal to animal that is responsible for the tradition. Absolutely, and that's another advantage of our, of our population because these meerkats are all living next to each other, they have overlapping territories, their habitats are more or less the same. And in fact, we went out and surveyed every single sleeping burrow that the meerkats have used for the past 11 years. So there were around 650 different sleeping burrows. So we tramped around the Kalahari surveying all of them. And we were able to factor in characteristics of the burrows and of the habitat, weather characteristics, all of that sort of thing into our analyses. So what did you find? Well, we found that, in fact, there are stable differences between groups. So often one group will consistently get up l earlier or later than its neighbour over very long periods of time. And it's interesting because some groups even use the same burrows. So one day group A will go and use the burrow and they'll get up early. And then a few days later group B will use the same burrow and they'll get up late. So it doesn't seem to be something that's driven by the burrows themselves, for example. When you say early or late, what times are we talking about? The differences can be quite variable. Sometimes groups that get up late, for example, might get up as late as an hour later than most other individuals. Um, often the differences are smaller, so it could be a matter of 10 minutes or so. But the interesting thing is that the, the direction of the differences seems to be very stable. But are we talking about sunrise, basically? They do get up very shortly after sunrise, yes. So all, all meerkats get up within an hour or so after sunrise. So. What leads you to think then that these different getting up times are really socially transmitted? Well, there's a number of factors. One is that we can be fairly sure that they're not due to genetic differences, as I mentioned, because males always move out of their own natal groups to breed. So you have extensive gene flow, the movement of genes between groups. We can also look at all sorts of different ecological factors and we find that these differences between groups are still visible even when we factor all these ecological effects into our models. 
The other thing is that we can look at what happens when immigrants come into groups. So when an individual comes into a group, if he's learned something, you would expect that he might adopt the tradition of his new group. And in fact, that's exactly what we find. So the getting up time of a group is not affected by immigrants coming in. They just carry on doing what they were always doing and the immigrants assimilate to their new group. And as the title of your paper suggests, the getting up time persists over the generation. So you can't just say, well, there's this particular individual in this group and he likes to get up early. And so that's why they get up early. No, that's right. It's, I mean, all the groups bar one that we've looked at have had complete turnover over the period that we've been looking at them. So all the meerkats that are alive today were not alive 11 years ago when the data used in these studies um, started to be collected. So it really does seem that it's something that's passed on through the generations rather than being driven by single individuals. Why do you think some meerkats would want to get up earlier rather than later? That's an interesting question and we don't really know the answer to that. What I suspect is happening is that it's what economists call an informational cascade. So maybe 10, 11 years ago, for some reason, some individual in the group started to get up early or late. Uh, we don't know why that might have happened. That's lost in, lost in history. Um, but this was maintained. So the group basically are a cohesive unit, more or less. So if you're the one meerkat who's getting up at a different time to the rest of the group, you're very vulnerable to predation. And meerkats are um, eaten by all sorts of different creatures, particularly eagles, uh, enemy number one. So I think it could be that simply following what everybody's doing leads to this cascade of information being transmitted through the generations, even though it no longer has any real meaning. So thinking more broadly about this, what does it help us understand that we didn't understand before? Well, one thing it helps us to understand is that we tend to think of human behaviour as being very culturally driven, whereas we think of animals as being mindless automatons driven by their genes. And this is a, obviously a very simplistic view, but what this sort of work helps us to, to do is to understand that in fact animal behaviour is to a large extent affected by, by cultures and traditions just as our own behaviour is. So we can start to get a handle on the biological origins of culture for instance. And it's also becoming increasingly clear that traditions and culture might actually affect the evolutionary process. So this is something that we're only really beginning to understand. There are all sorts of theoretical models suggesting that this should be the case. And the empirical research is just starting to look at whether the theoretical models may in fact be correct. Give me an example of how that would work in practice, say with animals. Um, well, I'll give you a human example, if I may, because they, these are the, the best understood examples at the moment. So one classic example is the evolution of lactose tolerance in human populations. So in certain human populations, people invented dairy farming. This was an excellent source of protein and fat. But the problem is that most human beings are unable to break down lactose from milk. And this is, this is the standard pattern across mammals where once an animal is weaned, it no longer needs to digest milk so the system breaks down. So what happened in populations that invented dairy farming, this is a very good idea, and it spread by social learning, so it spread as a tradition. But now you have a situation in which those individuals that are better able to break down lactose can take advantage of this excellent new resource. And so that created selection pressure, which has caused genetic changes in these populations. So if we look now at the alleles that allow lactose breakdown in modern human populations, there's a strong correlation with uh, the use of dairy farming by ancestral populations. So here a, a cultural invention has caused a genetic change in populations. I know that the situation with animals is much less clear, but if you think about animals which are becoming urbanised, which have normally been wild, like the fox, for example, mm. do you think that the sorts of cultural patterns that this might set up might then result in some sort of evolutionary difference? That could well be true, and I think it's, it would be very, very exciting to, to study this, because at the moment very little is known. So it could well be that learning from others facilitates the invasion of new niches, so if you're now entering a new niche, you're exposed to all sorts of different problems. An animal that's invaded an urban niche, for example, is, is affected by different light regimes because there are street lamps around, there are different sorts of food available, there are different sorts of danger. So over many generations, this might well lead to genetic changes. So the, the nature-nurture dichotomy just doesn't apply at all? No, I think that's correct. I mean, animals and human beings are affected to varying extents by 
what they inherit from their parents in terms of the genetic material and what they inherit from their parents and other individuals in terms of learnt information. The capacity to learn from others is obviously underpinned by biological genetic elements. So you're right that the, the dichotomy really doesn't hold. So Alex, what's next in this research then? Um, and there's all sorts of things that I, I would like to study in future. Um, we already know from a lot of previous research that the development of foraging skills in meerkats is massively affected by learning from others. And in fact, meerkats are one of the few animals known to teach their offspring. It would also be interesting to look at other behaviours. So what about the acquisition of anti-predator behaviour, learning to avoid predators? All of these things that we think of as basic characteristics of the species might well be modified by learning. And the next step, of course, is to try and investigate the implications of this. So can social learning really influence um, evolution, evolutionary patterns, as the models lead us to suggest? And this is going to be something that will take a very long time and a lot of collaborative effort to find out, but would be extremely exciting. Well, thank you, Alex, very much indeed. And thank you for watching. And that's all from this video podcast. Goodbye.